And they have a candidate who's very strong and is fighting with us for second place. Get out of here. Oh my god, the lights are gone. What are you gonna do? Let me check the door. Let's try to call the emergency. It's locked. I don't know for this. No reception. Oh my god. Let's call someone. Wait a try second. Someone. I don't there's a to... there's a Wi-Fi, an emergency Wi-Fi. Can you connect to it? Yeah, we can. Oh my god, thank god. Hello, and welcome to CMU TV News, bringing you the latest in disaster technology. After this earthquake, there's chaos and people are trapped. In this scenario, all local communication networks are down, but most people still have their smartphone on them. In this situation, these phones become useless for communication and finding help. The survivable social network on a chip is an embedded project that addresses this problem through hastily deployed networks of these devices. When communication infrastructure fails, a mesh of SSN OC nodes are deployed. These nodes run on Wi-Fi or cellular bands and will allow individuals to communicate and organize with one another. The ability to call for help, inform others of food and shelter, can be the difference between life and death. Now, we're gonna throw it to Xi'an at NASA Moffett Boulevard to take a look at the details of developing such a system. Thanks, Phil. I'm here at the NASA Moffett Field to see if we can get a hold of the SB1 team. When working with a software team, it is imperative that all members understand the problem at hand. For our project, we use object-oriented analysis and design to fully grasp the problem we were facing. Therefore, as the requirement involves, the OOAD practices make the project manageable to handle and follow. So, Tiziano, how did we organize our team and adjust our development methods? We opted for a mostly Kanban development methodology. This was the best option for us because we were scouted for our skills, but we didn't know each other. So Kanban allowed us to deal with that uncertainty uh, by allowing us to take on features and use cases as we completed them. Uh, we didn't want to immediately assign features like in Scrum uh, because we weren't familiar uh, with, each, with each other's capability. Uh, however, the requirements grew in a Scrum-like fashion uh, because every two weeks there were the deliverables due. So our Kanban board was reflected on an online platform, Trello, allowing us to work in a decentralized fashion. Thank you, Tanziana. So, Shuchida, what practices do you find most useful throughout this project? Uh, according to me, testing was a significant part of our development. Mm -hmm. We used cross-testing, unit test, and integration throughout the semester. Uh, having separate people working on testing versus developing ensured a coverage, coverage of all the blind spots. This also creates better team understanding of the implementation because uh, writing tests for a teammate's module, it helps you understand how that module works. Okay. Let's have a look what happened earlier in this project.
voice mail again. Hey man, this is the third time I've called you. Give me a call back. How do I authenticate a user? This thing is not working. We're stuck here. We're not going to be able to move on until he gets back to us. There's gotta be a better way to do this. We made the decision to keep our project strictly separated into three different tiers, connected in a service fashion. This leveraged the team's expertise. How do we know if this implementation will work with the database? As long as we follow the REST API that he gave us, it will work. Oh! oh low coupling, coupling, high cohesion! cohesion. Thanks, Xian. Now that we've learned about what goes into creating such a system, we've invited a guest to the studio to talk about the technical aspects of our project. Please welcome Joao. Thanks for coming to the studio today. Thanks, Phil. Let me talk a little bit about the architecture of the system. We segmented the project into three tiers. A front tier using Backbone.js, which has a UI. A middle tier using Node.js, a JavaScript platform for easily building fast, scalable network applications and a back tier using Java. We use the service-oriented approach for communication between tiers. This allowed for almost independent development of those tiers. Huh, that's really interesting. You mentioned backbone.js. Why did you use it? Seeing that this application is running on a small chip, computation power is limited. However, smartphones nowadays are becoming more and more powerful. Backbone allows us to leverage that computing capability by pushing most of the non-critical processing onto the client. Neat. Well, we have a clip here that demonstrates the performance of our system. I understand that this decision made it easier to test individual modules and trace bugs more quickly. Can you elaborate on your testing? Sure, Phil. That's actually a good question. We use different test frameworks for each tier. The back tier used JUnit and ECL EMMA. The middle tier used Mocha and Istanbul for testing and code coverage. And finally, the UI was tested using Selenium. We put lots of efforts into testing because we knew the requirements would change significantly with time. And we wanted to make sure previous code wouldn't break. Thanks so much for coming on to our show today. Now, our final topic of the day will be lessons learned. Let's pass it back to Xian to hear from our developers. Thanks, Phil. Okay, guys, looking back at our projects, what do you think we could have done better? Well, we didn't put much focus into continuing integration early. Mm -hmm. So uh, we couldn't foresee deployment issues when moving to production mm -hmm. on the Beaglebone. Okay. So at any point in the iterations, it was hard to determine uh, the actual progress of the project. And we had no way to see all parts working in production until right before the due date of the deliverable. Um, so this caused uh, insecurity and stress several times in, in our development cycle. Interesting. It's late, this is due tomorrow, it's just not working. Oh, whatever, I'm going to sleep. What's wrong? Have you pushed the code to the bigger one? Yes, but the issue is doing it so late in the week. Hmm. Having continuous integration uh, makes the state of the project more clear and progress more reliable. Okay, Shuchita, what is the one thing you learned from this project? We spent too much uh, time continuously discussing the vision, but... Yes, uh, there was a lack of defining product management, uh, which made uh, initial traction difficult. Yep. So uh, meetings were too lengthy because of that. And it's like sled dogs running in different directions. 
Um, so lots of combined effort, uh, but with little movement or, or progress. And yeah. So it seems like our horizontal structure works with unique people and groups, but the common vertical structure works with about everyone. Back to you guys. Well, those are some really interesting lessons, guys. Hey, Joao, was there anything else that we learned throughout this project? Well, it was interesting, but we actually found that pair programming reduced our lengthy meetings. How did it do that? Pair programming is an effective way to push group-wide understanding of the project and code. It also created team bonding with our colleagues. This was reflected in our meetings and contributed to higher overall teamwork efficiency. All right, awesome. Thanks to everyone for being here and watching today. Thank Have you. Have a good evening. I don't, I can't call anyone. It's like, I don't have any reception here. What should this I is, do? I want to go to my mom. This is some sort of emergency web app. Can you call my mom from it? No, I because the cell towers are down. But we can call a, an emergency responder. Who is it? These, these I don't know. Let's try, try it. Try it. For our unique feature, we will have a new kind of user in our system that are designated emergency responders. Calling emergency responders places a voice call to an available emergency responder, which Tassiano has just done. Users can then relay information to them over call and ask for help. However, it's important to only enable people to call emergency responders and not their friends and family, which would quickly congest the network. Communication networks are known to fail in disaster scenarios due to overloads. This optimizes voice communication to only the strictly necessary parties. Thanks, Phil. Okay, guys. What do you think we could have done better? <laughs> 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 yeah, but I forget looking.